little change in communications. Um, our next speaker is astronaut Jerry Leninger. Many of you know him. We are proud to have him in our community. And that's all I'm going to say. If I could reach the top of a mountain, would it make me feel bigger or smaller? If I could touch the sky, would it affect the way I feel about the planet? If I could walk with the stars, would it change the things I wish for? If I could experience a place with no walls, would I still call it space? If I could view the world as a whole, would I have more respect for my neighbor? If I could leave my world for a while, would I return a different man? If I could live in the heavens, would it change the way I think about God? If I could reach the top of a mountain, would it make me feel bigger or smaller? T minus 10, 9, 8, 7. We have go for main engine start. We have main engine start. Five, four, three, two. One. Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery with a crew of six astronaut heroes. off with a shuttle going off. Thank you. You know, I'll tell you, I don't know, some of y'all, I, I, I see you here today, thanks for coming. Yesterday at the State Theater, we had a live feed of Endeavor taking off on its final mission. And I'll tell you, man, it is good to be an American, good to see what we can do, not in the virtual world, but in the real world, sending rockets into space. And it was a glorious time, and we had fun over at the theater. Today I want to try to shift your perspective a little bit. That's what I titled it, and I've been winging it basically, so sorry Paul. I never rehearse a whole lot of things, I just kind of try to listen to everything today and try to make something relevant to all, to all of our brains, I guess, what we've been absorbing all day. But I went to space for five months, Russian space station, and I've seen the world from a different viewpoint. As myself, two Russian cosmonauts, five months, they spoke no English, broken down communication system, only talked in Russia to, a, again, a land antenna over Moscow every 90 minutes if we were lucky. And I saw what you just saw, that grand view of the world. But then I was stuck with myself and isolated and removed from mankind. 
like I've never been in my life. We've been talking, I'm an old naval officer, been out submarines, aircraft carriers. I'll tell you, this is a whole different world. Cut off, removed from mankind, stuck with myself. Reminds me of Pascal, the French philosopher, and his poncies and his thoughts. He says, go in a room, close a door. Are you comfortable with who you are as a person? And that's a drill you all had to do tonight. Go in a room, close a door. Are you comfortable with the way you're living your life, the kind of person you are? And five months of introspection is a bit much, but a half hour is good now and then. <laughs> But I'll tell you, when you just saw that grand view of the world, coupled with being cut off, isolated, stuck with myself, changed me forever. And one of those big changes is what I call a change of perspective. I want to take you through a launch, because you just saw it there. We saw it yesterday live, Endeavor going up. But you go in there, you lie on your back for about two hours, they strap you in, you get that dramatic countdown, 10, 9, 8. You know, whoever invented that thing, they had to shoot them, because the adrenaline is going just fine without the dramatic countdown. Three, two, one, boom, huge explosion. Shuttle lifts off, you go inverted. 2,000 switches are just going like this. It's like a marble inside a tin can, violent, chaotic. You're being thrown around. Two minutes later, boom, boom, big explosion. Those solid rocket boosters literally explode off. Ride goes from utter chaos to pure acceleration. Now you're in a dragster. Paul jumps on my chest as I accelerate. I feel those two Gs, and someone else jumps on his chest, you're now pulling three Gs, sustain that for the last two and a half minutes, engines cut off, bodies fly away, you become weightless, your own body flies away, and it is, ah, uh, three G crush, release, float, overhead window, peninsula of Florida, hook of Cape Cod, Great Lakes, greatest freshwater collection of water on earth over there. You know. Yahoo, you're in space, and that's what those guys were doing yesterday. And I'll tell you, I was getting chills. You know, I was getting chills watching that. And those lucky dogs, you know, I wish I was up there right now because now they are floating effortlessly. I floated effortlessly for five months on a Russian space station. And I'll tell you, when I first came back, you talk about shift of perspective. In a room like this, I'd be holding on for dear life. I'd say, holy cow, look at the volume in this place. We could sleep 100,000 people in here. Look at all the sleeping places. <laughs> you know, you talk about perspective shift. I did not see floor, walls, and ceiling. I was three-dimensional. About 30 days into that mission, same thing happened to my crewmates. If I want to fly to the back corner, it was push off, fingertip, and I'm on my way. A few barrel rolls for the fun of it. I'd start laughing. I'd say, Jerry, you don't even know you're in space anymore. Adaptability of a human being, it's incredible. Talk about shift of perspective. I'll take you on one orbit. I took the, the luxury, five months I had that luxury. I'd sort of levitate over a window, kind of yin yoga kind of stuff. Just float over a window for 90 minutes, and that's how long it takes to get around the Earth at 18,000 miles an hour. And I saw the sun rise, and I saw the sunset, and the islands of Japan just outlining lights, just looking like a map and looked up at the stars, and you see about four times the number of stars you'd see from the best vantage point on Earth. And there's a little different perspective on that one, too. I started trying to name them, and I said, how ridiculous is this? <laughs> you know, what do we do that for? Why do we categorize things all the time? You know, this religion, this culture, this language, those people, us, stars. You know, the belt of Orion, who cares? It's just stars, just take it in. It's, it's a gift from God. You know, the beauty of the stars, different perspective on things. Lots and lots of different perspectives. So I levitate over the Earth one time, and I'll tell you some of the things I could see in a typical orbit, and a lot of people talking about sustainability, and Carl this morning will appreciate some of this. You go over the Amazon, for example, and you see these little dots of light there's thousand of them out there, you know, the clear cut in the jungles in the Amazon. Now, if you want to change your perspective, step back, look at the big picture of planet Earth. It's almost like stabbing the lungs of a human being, because that's 25, 30% of Earth's oxygen being generated out of those green jungles. Life support system, living on a space station, I learned to appreciate, you know, fresh air. Everyone take a deep breath. It's there. You don't have to make this air. It's got oxygen in it. 
don't have to do anything to it. It's just a carefree existence we have on earth, and we just take it for granted. You know, I try to get up every day, different perspective. <sighs> Count my blessings. What a carefree life. What a great life we have here. You should be smiling every second of your life. Just take a deep breath when things aren't looking good and say, got it pretty good. No different perspective. Fly over Africa, Sub-Sahel, Africa, down below the Sahara Desert there. They've got dust storms going, and you can see them on a global level. You can actually see the dust going halfway across that ocean, actually going all the way across the ocean, backing up on the Andes Mountains and depositing that topsoil. You know, Africa's loss, South America's gain. Global event, nobody appreciates what's happening. Keep going. I see a volcano exploding. I'm going to save that one. I'll tell you another thing I saw. Over Calgary in Canada, Calgary as the hockey players say, in Calgary in Canada, I kept seeing this little thing just downwind from the city of Calgary. It was a little dot. I mean, if you take the sharpest pencil you've ever made and make the lightest dot you can possibly make, that's what I saw just downwind of Calgary. And I kept wondering what the heck that was. Finally pulled out the big dog binoculars, one pass, perfect orbit right over the top. I said, aha, it's got a little funnel shape to it. That must be their coal-fired plant in wintertime. And this was getting to be April, May already. And that white cover, you could sort of see where there's a little bit of downwind from that coal-powered you know, plant. And I can hear the people sitting there feeling smug. And I'm not just talking about that, I'm talking to everybody. We all feel so smug in our knowledge of things and how smart we are. And they were saying, yeah, way to go, Jerry. Tell them about what that coal's doing down there. Now let me go back to my volcano. We're flying over Papua New Guinea. We get a call up. This was actually on STS-64, a shuttle mission of mine. We get a heads up. There's a lot of volcanic activity down there, Papua New Guinea. We go flying over the top, and I'll tell you, this thing exploded. Unbelievable flames into the air, lava flowing down, smoke into the air. You know, the, the, the steam from that thing hitting the high-level winds spread out for about 3,000 miles. No exaggeration, 3,000 miles of steam. Going the other direction and at a lower level, not lower level, not high-level winds, but lower-level winds were drawing it the other direction. That was the noxious chemicals, the ash, the smoke, the nitrous oxide, all the different junk that comes out of the live planet Earth. And it's covering probably 1,000 miles by 1,500 miles with just this black gunk from inside the planet. And so I ask you again, perspective. And I'm not even giving you a view. Get rid of all the knowledge you know about Earth and everything else and what you might think my views are on things. And just look at this volcano. And look at this speck that with big dog binoculars I could make out might be a little bit of coal dust going down there. And let me give you a different perspective. I'm up here in the lights and the microphone was working. I think you can still hear me, can you? It's nice to have power. Let me keep going one more step. Make people, everyone uncomfortable here. We'll get over China. I get over China. Carl's been over there. I'll tell you, man, I used to go to Hong Kong, my old Navy days, beautiful harbor. I've gone there the last 10 years. I can't even see across the harbor anymore. Carl's nodding. You go to China from space, you know, someone in Trivial Pursuit said the only man-made object you can see from space is the Great Wall of China. You know, not true. Matter of fact, I think it was John Glenn that said that. Could you see it? He said, yeah, I probably could. His orbit wasn't even high enough. They didn't have enough oomph back then. He didn't even fly over China. <laughs> But the problem with China now is they are clear-cutting the forest in Mongolia, and there's a smoke pall, and they are polluting. You talk about coal being abused, power plants in China, it is one big wipeout. You can't even see Beijing at night. So again, I, I ask you to get perspective on things. A dot, a thousand mile by 1,500 mile blotch on the earth made by the earth and China obliterated by bad environmental practices. And if you can step back and look at the big picture, you might say, hey, we need to fix Brazil. That's the lungs of the earth. You know, we need to fix China. That's where the problem is. We're getting pretty good over here. Let's squeeze it out. Who wants to be downwind from a coal plant that's got soot in the air? Nobody. 
common sense. So don't get me wrong on that count, but you know, you got to look at things, put them in perspective a little bit. And I am privileged, and I'm trying to pass along a little vicarious living in this space. I am privileged, first of all, to represent you all in space, represent our great country, represent the world, moving mankind forward. And that's the way I looked at it, and that's how you get through five months in space with fires, collisions, oxygen systems breaking down. You know, that's how you get through the end of the day, you knowing you're representing mankind, moving us forward. It's worth your life. You know, put things in perspective a little bit. I need help, and here we have a man coming up, and I'm going to give you a different, let's hear it for this guy, because Paul Sutherland did a lot to get us all here. And you all know Paul, so he brought his, what do you got, Paul? A hula hoop kind of beat up. My kids are getting old now. We won't even go anymore, but Paul brought a hula hoop. What do you guys think? It looks like a hula hoop. You know, a different perspective. To me, that's an orbit. That looks like an orbit. You know, because I'm used to thinking about orbits and orbital mechanics. So, Paul, if you can hold that out in good light. That's the orbit. And I want to explain one thing, because a lot of people at the theater yesterday, when I was explaining things, I don't think they got this, and I think 90% of the world doesn't get it. When you launch that shuttle off planet Earth, no, that is not my hockey stick handling ball. That is planet Earth, okay? When you launch off of planet Earth, you launch basically into a hula hoop, 250 miles above the Earth, and it takes all that power I talked about, and then you insert yourself into an orbit, and you hope it's the same orbit basically that the space station's in, the International Space Station, and a couple days later, you're rendezvous and you dock. But you're in this hula hoop, and you have nothing no energy, no power. It takes way too much power to change the angle of that hula hoop in any direction. So once you launch a space shuttle off Earth, you are now in a hula hoop, and you're going to stay in that hula hoop forever. Actually, a couple hundred years. Eventually, atomic action slows you down. You want to come back to Earth, you just flip the shuttle over, start firing different thrusters that do work up in space. In the opposite direction, you slow yourself down. What happens? You end up on a smaller hula hoop. Where's planet Earth, atomic ox oxygen, things like that, atmosphere, it's going out there into space, you start picking up friction, 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 pretty soon you really start picking up friction, and over the coast of California, you're doing this during re-entry, and you got a fireball around you, and the whole shuttle shaking, and if you don't like re-entry, or if you don't like uh, flying in an airplane with little turbulence, you would not like re-entry in the <laughs> shuttle. You know, locomotive train coming back, but that's about it. How about I want to go to the moon? How the heck do I do that? I told you I can't change this at all. I just speed up a little bit. Going 17,500 miles an hour, you get an Apollo capsule, 18, 19, 20, 21, go about 25,000 miles an hour. Now planet Earth's trying to pull you back with that gravity, but you're going awful fast. And pretty soon you hit 25,000 miles an hour, and boom, you're on your way. That's how you get to the moon. So orbital mechanics here, I just wanted Paul to help. Now, Paul, you can hold the hockey ball if you would. Okay. Why don't you just hold that up? Pretend you have a backlit room here, and that ball, I'm, I'm doing a little thing on perspective, and I'm just winging it, so bear with me. Perspective, what do you guys see? Hold it up so they can all kind of tell what that is. And Paul, can you walk through the audience with that? Do you mind jumping down, just walking? Come on, man. We'll put the guy to work. He said he hasn't done anything. It's everyone else that did all the work. What? Stop, freeze, freeze. Ma'am, what, what do you see? You see a, a ball, a sphere? How about you over here? Ball, sphere, everybody seeing the same thing? Keep going, Paul, all the way back, up and back. Everybody's seeing a ball, okay? It's a pretty, pretty simple thing. I don't care what your angle is, how you're looking at it, you're seeing a ball. Any question about that? Think, where's he going here? Where's this leading to? Next thing I got, I got this cone here. Little cone-shaped thing. Pointy end, circular on the bottom. Got some mathematicians I was having lunch with. I forget, you know, pi r squared and then the height and some other thing. Get the, get the uh, cubic volume of that thing. But this thing's a little, you can come back up, Paul, thank you. This thing's a little different. You know, if I had a backlit stage here and you're looking at this thing and you can't really see it, what are you, what are you seeing? You're seeing a circle. I'm telling you, man, that, that is not a circle, that's a cone. You're saying, no, no, that's a circle, that's a circle. And if Paul went walking down the aisle, people on the side, what would you be saying? What am I seeing? Triangle. 
I'm seeing a triangle. And you guys would be saying, hey, man, it is a circle. And you guys are saying, it's a triangle. And pretty soon you're saying, those guys are crazy, man. I don't know what's wrong with them. Have they no brain? You know, different perspective. Get out in space, look at the big picture, different perspective on things. It's not the ball anymore, it's a cone. Let me go to something that I promised my fellow astronauts I will always talk about. We had an all-astronauts meeting, all the retired, crusty Apollo guys. And I want you all to just, for a minute here, we do this once every couple years, astronaut reunion, Johnson Space Center. I'll tell you, these old Apollo guys, great to hang out with those heroes, you know, doing stuff. Do you remember any of that, sir? When they're blasting off the moon, I mean, it's incredible what these guys were doing. John Young, as a matter of fact, just between us, told me privately, but I think it's okay, he's a hero. He's the astronaut's astronaut. John Young drove the rover on the moon, did the first two operational shuttle flights. You ever look at a shuttle, when it, if you really just look at it, it looks like it shouldn't fly. It's got these two boosters strapped on because it didn't have enough oomph with the engines. It's got an orbiter, that looks okay, that could fly. And it's got this big old tank on the outside. None of that could be tested unmanned like you did old rockets. You'd launch them, they'd blow up. You'd say, hmm, we need to tweak that, launch the next one. Finally put a capsule on top. By the way, when I look at this thing, I don't see a cone. I see an Apollo capsule, <laughs> you know? So I've got a different perspective on how I see things. They put that capsule on top eventually, and they'd blast off. John Young told me in private, my wife was good friends of his wife. We used to have Sunday night dinners at his house. He said, Jerry, to be honest with you, my thought on flying that first shuttle mission, I thought my odds of making it back were maybe 30%, 25%, probably 75% chance that thing wasn't going to make it. You know, old naval aviator, man, I'm proud of John Young and naval aviation and all the people serving our country, SEAL teams, you know, you name it, putting their lives on the line. John Young did it. Why'd he do it? 25% chance that he's going to make it. You know, he did it because he said, Jerry, it's worth my life. It's worth my life, what I was doing there. Um, but I digress in that little story. I'm back to my perspective here. John Young flying to the moon, Apollo capsule, seeing things a little bit differently. And after our astronaut reunion, all the astronauts got together, except maybe two of us, and uh, signed a big letter, USA Today, saying, man, we really don't like what's happening with our manned space program right now. And I don't think most people understand it, and I understand why you don't understand it, because you don't have enough time to look into it. I think generally people appreciate what the space program does for us, how, how it's uh, moved us forward. But we sort of made a pact that whenever we get in a public forum, we're going to talk about our space program. And this is really hard, but you have to do this. This is something you have to do. Forget the politics. Forget who I like, who I don't like. Forget who you like. Anything else, I'm just using this as an example. So you see a little different perspective. You can see this thing, yeah, it's a circle, it's a triangle, and then hopefully you bring it to the light, and that's what media is all about, bringing things to the light, three-dimensional. You see this thing, you say, hey, it's a cone. We can all agree on that. But I'll tell you, what I've been seeing in media is just a, you know, blockers being put up here and everybody just seeing the circle. And let me tell you about our space program. Let me tell you what was supposed to happen. Uh, under the last administration, they decided we have to phase the shuttle out. NASA administrator, smart guy, engineer, says we have this much money. We cannot go to the next generation spacecraft with this much money. Unless we stop the shuttle, we're going to have about a one-year gap, and then that money will be applied to building what we've already designed, spending, by the way, uh, millions of dollars to design, ready to go. One-year gap. We build the next generation space vehicle, much more capable. Then the space shuttle can go to the Mars, it can go to the moon, you know, state-of-the-art computers, state-of-the-art materials, big, giant step forward. That's the game plan. New administration comes in and says, we don't like that game plan. We're not going to build that next generation vehicle. Here's your budget, NASA. We're not going to cut it, but take one-third of it and give it to these five private companies. And they're the SpaceX's of the world. They're different people. And to be honest with you, they're people that gave a lot of political contributions, formed a little group, and they got about a third of NASA's money. NASA cannot build that next generation space vehicle at this point. 
And so what happens, and I just again try to get out of all of our political biases and just listen to the story because it's illustrative of what happens a lot of times, I'm afraid. I know space and I know how this was orchestrated. They find a couple astronauts, like I say, I think there's two out of all of us that would go on any trip to announce to the workers at uh, Kennedy Space Center that they're about to be laid off and that the on vehicle's not gonna happen. Got uh, Aldrin and another person, I won't say who, they got them on the flight. They stood out, they waved, they said, no problem, we're gonna give you, we're laying you all off, but no problem, we're gonna extend your unemployment benefits for another three months, we got that for you. We're not building the, gener the next generation vehicle. We're gonna go to an asteroid, we've already been to the moon, we don't need to repeat that. And, oh, by the way, the shuttle's canceled because the last administration canceled it. Okay, so I guess what I'm saying on perspective, be careful. Be careful what you're looking at. Because the last administration really didn't cancel. The last administration phased it out fiscally responsible in order to go to the next generation manned spacecraft. And let me just tell you the end result of all this then is that five companies that have never built spacecraft before are now building spacecraft. And you say privatization's great, I agree, but Boeing has built spacecraft. A tool and die shop in Peoria, Illinois has helped build the nuts and bolts, and the thousand lowest bidders put together the space shuttle. And it's been private people, it's NASA vision. NASA collecting smart people from around the world, and as we were talking, as David said, you know, it's sexy, people want to work in space, you collect the brain power of the world, the world comes to work, and then you, privatize that by sending out the contracts, competitive bidding. But now we've got basically the end of the shuttle program, Endeavor launch, last launch of Endeavor. We've got Atlantis doing its last launch end of July, and that's it. And at this point forward, we are basically dependent on the Russian government for getting us up to our International Space Station. We have no manned vehicle whatsoever. We're hoping that the vehicle that these new companies are gonna build, by the way, those companies, um, it's funny, you talk to Walt Cunningham, an old crusty Apollo guy. They gave the presentation, they got done, Walt Cunningham says, excuse me, excuse me. Hey, J hey uh, Alan Bean, another guy walked on the moon, fourth man on the moon. Alan, didn't we build that vehicle in uh, 1962? <laughs> and Alan says, yeah, July of 62, we built an unmanned rocket that could go up and uh, just barely make it to orbit. You know, I tell you, I'll tell you one quote I've always loved, and that's John Kennedy saying, we choose to go to the moon and do other things, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. And then he goes on to talk about that type of challenge is what's going to move us forward, move our technology forward, you know, create jobs, do all the things that technology can do. One last thing. I was told I had a little extra time because it's, 1,500, we're ending, I got five minutes, so I'm gonna end it with this, though. John Young, one thing he always told me, and we had this discussion, so I think maybe everyone's interested. John Young told me, Jerry, we never went to the moon with sacks of money. I never understood what people thought, that they think we were taking that money that we spent in space and buried it in the lunar soil. You know, that money went to, again, some company in Detroit. I got a friend who has a, a steel foundry in Midland. He made the big tracks, the, the tank tread type things that take the shuttle out to the launch pad. Went to the tool and die shop in Peoria, Illinois. It went to engineers and went to postgraduate studies. It went to make smart engineers. It went to create people. By the way, this 3D, 4D stuff, man, I used to train virtual reality inside a spacesuit, and the guys that trained me, after about five years, one guy from France, one from China, they went off Silicon Valley, started their own company, virtual reality company, hired about 300 people, got bought out by Pixar, made a lot of money, a lot of people made a lot of money. You know, incubator for brain power, new ideas, you go out and you keep the United States technology high, you keep us, you know, create jobs, everything else it does. So we don't bury money on the moon. We're not burying money now in our space program. We're inspiring kids, you know, moving our technology forward, creating new jobs. So that was my, I'm sorry, I'm stuck telling you about that. I think it's kind of interesting stuff. And again, what, if nothing else, if you don't even care about the space program, just understand that you gotta work hard at getting the full picture, understanding what's coming, and not just taking the 
few simple words and letting them say, okay, that all makes total sense when it may not make total sense. I'll tell you, after 132 days in space, and I had that space shuttle come to pick me up, you know, greatest sight in the world, United States, you know, flag out on that wing coming to get me, different crew firing the thrusters, did our re-entry. By the way, re-entry, and that's going to be coming up here for our crew, and Greg Johnson, who has family home up there in Long Lake, is the pilot of that particular flight. Last thing you do in the shuttle, you're a glider, you glide down, not only hit, you know, the peninsula of Florida and planet Earth, but based on firing the engines halfway around the world, you glide down, and you've got to hit the approach end of a runway at the end of a Kennedy Space Center on altitude at 220 knots. All predicated on firing the engines for precisely, you know, 47.621 seconds halfway around the Earth. You know, smart people getting laid off right now uh, that figure this stuff out, it's unbelievable. Uh, last thing you do, though, is a manual landing in the shuttle. So in this case, Mark Kelly, who's a friend of mine, and uh, his wife, Gabrielle, will probably be there again, a congresswoman. Uh, last thing they do, yank it around, last two sonic booms up behind, you dive down about eight times as steeply as you would in a commercial airliner. He then pulls back, you flare. Uh, co-pilot, uh, who'll be Greg Johnson, he'll let the gear down, touch down, nose gear down, roll out, unfurl the parachute, deceleration, we'll stop. That side gate will open, they'll open that hatch and <sighs> fresh air, and they'll be smiling. <laughs> Next thing will happen, that flight surgeon come on board. I'll tell you, after me, five months in space, here's my experience at that point. Flight surgeon comes on board. I'm lying there. They're really concerned about the ability of my heart to keep the blood to the brain after five months in space. Matter of fact, the guy before me at four months in space said he felt like he weighed 3,000 pounds, plastered the deck, could not lift his arms up. Came in with stretchers, carrying him off. Uh, so in my case, really worried, especially about the blood getting to the brain, the heart able to do its thing. Uh, but in any case, told my this flight surgeon comes on board, says, we've got guys with stretchers ready to carry you off. Let us know when you're ready, Jerry. And I said, Tom, I said, I've been in space for five months. I've overcome a lot of tough times, a lot of difficulties up there. I'm an officer of the United States Navy, and we don't get carried off on stretchers. <laughs> and And I said, I'm going to walk off this thing, or I'm going to crawl off this thing, but I'm going to do it on my own power, and please don't touch me. You know, I see a look in some of your eyes, you're my kind of people. You know, you start something, you finish it. You don't give up because it's tough at the end. I'd rather be passed out. I'd rather be dead than to be carried off that shuttle. And Tom knows me well enough, knows I'm stubborn, said, okay, you're called Jerry. I stood up. Sure enough, vision goes gray, 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 gray. <laughs> it's like pulling too many Gs, too tight, too fast, F-14, but right about here, heart remembered what to do. Could literally feel the ventricles contracting, blood, carotid artery, retinal artery. Vision opens back up again. Tell myself, good, didn't pass out. <laughs> now, shuffle my way forward. Feels like you're on my shoulders the whole time. Methodical turn, climb over Mount Everest. It's actually my seat. Uh, <laughs> Climb out the side hatch, two big guys standing there say, welcome back, Captain Leninger. And I said, man, it's great to be back. You know, he set the stretchers aside, walked down a gang plague medical treatment area. They started doing this. And they said, you make us proud, Captain Leninger. And some of you guys know my wife, so I'm going to finish. I'm running out of time, but I'm going to finish with this. Our medical test, and finally got to go see my wife, Catherine. She's standing there holding John. He was about a year and a half years old. Wife's pregnant again, two weeks away from delivery. You know, John looks huge. My wife looks. <laughs> no, I learned my lesson. I never say that. Actually, I'll tell you, man, my wife looked beautiful. You know, my wife looked beautiful. That was the greatest moment of my life right there. Back on Earth, air all around me. Son, baby to be. I'll tell you, last thing I'll leave you with, big picture thing. Big picture thing. People say, how do you top blasting off into space? I'll tell you, how you top it is relationships. People in your lives that you care about. You know, you don't have to blast off into space to know what's important. People around you, people you care about. 
Again, absolutely honored representing you all in space. Good to be back here in the greatest place on the planet. Thank you very much. <laughs>